rules for human behavior. We need to be able to associate with each other in a progressive way. And not everybody's going to be a Paramahamsa. So we need a Vaishnava society that has some sense of Vanashram. But our Vanashram is not ever going to be the same as Vedic Vanashram. Because we, can't, we simply can't understand it. And it's very difficult for people to understand when they begin to come to Krishna consciousness the statements that Srila Prabhupada makes about women. The statements that the Vedic literatures make about women. And people become offended by it. But I would suggest that, first of all, we should understand that if you want to study another culture, it's so very difficult. Let's say Japanese culture, which is also a very rich and ancient culture. If you want to understand Japanese culture, maybe you'll move to Japan, maybe you'll learn Japanese. I have a friend who did like that. And after 20 years, he told me, I don't really understand this culture. You can understand something. And what to speak of Vedic culture? It's so much, much, much more subtle. So Prabhupada wanted us to have Vanashram Dharma, but it's not exactly the same Vanashram Dharma is that that we find in the Vedic literature. Our Vanashram Dharma is meant for Haritoshanam, for pleasing the Lord, and for liberating ourselves. And we have another kind of conception about women. It's a very difficult thing for us to understand Japanese culture. It's a very difficult thing for us to understand Vedic culture. I like to say that in both cultures, in Western culture and Indian culture, women are worshipped. If you don't believe me, yesterday we were in Stockholm and I saw so many deities everywhere I go, so many pictures. Women are worshipped. But they're worshipped in Western culture as hot babes. And it's probably a very intoxicating thing to be a young hot babe. But your uh, status doesn't last for so long. After a few too many milkshakes and pizzas or something, you become a little bigger. And then the men in the culture, they don't want them. And that's a very disturbing thing because that's 50% of our society. So 50% of our society, they're, they're loved and worshipped, so-called worshipped, so-called loved, as sex objects. But then when they get a bit fatter and whatever, then it's a garbage culture also. That's the number one product that we produce in the world today. Not cars, not cell phones, not makeup or clothes, but everybody would produce garbage. That's the number one thing. We throw things away. And we, our relationships are also based on garbage. We have no conception of uh, fidelity. We have no conception of faithfulness or honesty. So they worship women as sex objects. And then when they become a little too fat or a little too old or they nag too much or something, then they just get a new one. And they tell women that this is perfectly natural and you should be happy with this because you're just like a man, you're also equal, and you can go and try to find another man. I mean, one small detail, women get pregnant and men don't. And they get stuck with a child. And therefore, as Prabhupada said, it's becoming a great burden on the society that the governments have to take care of these children who have no fathers. So in Western culture, they worship women. In Indian culture also, women are worshipped. And we compiled some statements in Vedic literature about this. And it's very important that we should understand this principle. In Vedic culture, women are worshipped, but the worship is mothers. Rama Vivarta Purana describes, Mattariti the Sabdena, Yamcha Samba Sate Naraha, Samati Tulya Sati Nadana Sakshi Satam. That if you address someone as Mataji, and now I know sometimes in Iskand it's almost a slur, a bad word. The Prabhu is over here, and the Mataji is over there, right? because Mataji means Maya or something like that. And I've seen it sometimes in the West, the ladies don't like to be called Mataji. If you go, to some, I remember once I said something to about a 16 year old girl, excuse me, Mataji, and not the Mataji. <laughs> he said like this. But I've seen in the villages in the Rissa in West Bengal, if you go to a five-year-old girl and you say, excuse me, Mataji, she'll say, yes. <laughs> She's so happy. Because it has a completely different connotation. And what's in a name? I, it's, it's semantics. Shiva Prabhupada, sometimes you address in letters, Jamuna or Malati and other lady disciples, sometimes you call them Prabhu. 
so some devotees say we should call all the Matajis Prabhu. I don't mind. It, it's in, what's in a word. If you want to do that, that's fine. I have a problem. I live in India. And if I address a lady as Prabhu there, it's like calling someone sir, a lady sir, a mister. Here, it, 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 people don't appreciate that. It's very strange to them. And moreover, there's a culture behind saying Mataji. I, I never saw or heard of Shiva Prabhupada addressing any of the Western disciples he had. Western ladies as Mataji. That's another thing. So, the Brahma Bhavarta Purana says, Mataruti Vasabdina Yamcha Sambhasate Naraha. If you address someone as Mataji, Dharma witnesses that. It's such a sacred thing. And in truth, that person becomes like your mother. The Narada Pancharatra Vaishnava literature describes why we say Jai Radha Madhav, why we don't put Krishna's name first before Radharani's name. Adosam Uchadet Radham Paschat Krishnam Chamadam Viparitam Yadi Patet Brahmahatyam Labed Dhruvam. First you say the name Radha, and then you say the name Krishna Madhav. And if you do the opposite of that, then Brahmahatyam Labed Dhruvam, you get the result of killing a Brahman. It's very bad. Why? Sri Krishna Jagatam Tato Jagan Mata Charadika Pitu Sadvanot Mata Vandya Puja Gariyasi Because Krishna is the father of the world and Radharani is the mother of the world and the mother is 100 times more worshipable and higher in point of respect due than the father. This is Vedic culture. This is Vaishnava culture. The mother is worshipped more than the father. But it's a, a different kind of thing. It requires some subtle discrimination. Uh, not given respect in the same way that we may think in the West. They're protected. In the West, we sometimes think of that as a kind of abuse. That if a woman is protected as something, that, that means she's being abused. But that's a silly idea. If you value something, you protect it. And because women are so valued, the mother is the, the greatest personality in the world in Vedic culture. There's a Hindi saying, Matana Kormata Putana Puta Ku Puta Balahi. Your mother is never bad. Even if the son is bad, the son may be bad, but the mother is never bad. Mother can never be criticized. The um, Mahabharata, Anasasana Parva, chapter 105, text 15 to 16 states, Dasa Chaiva Pitin Mata Sarvam Vapiti Venma Pi. Goravana Abhivavati Nasti Matri Samoguru Matagari Yasi Yachcha Tenaitam Manyate Janaha that your mother is equal to ten fathers. Your mother is equal to the whole earth. There's no senior person equal to the mother. Indeed, she's above all others in terms of the reverence and respect due to her. It is for this reason that people offer so much respect to their mother. Many, many statements are there in Vedic literature. We compiled an article about this a few years ago in a Bindu magazine about the glories of mothers. It's a different kind of culture where mothers are respected. But again, this is on the mundane platform. This is not on the transcendental platform. But it's something which helps. Manasanghita, third chapter, text 55 and 59 state, Prithibir Bratribis Chaita. Patibir Devaraishtata Puja Busayutav Tascha Bahu Kalyanam Ipsubihi. Women must be honored. They must be given respect. How are they given respect? Uh, and by who? They're given respect by giving ornaments by them to them. And by their fathers, brothers, husbands, and brothers in law who desire their own welfare. If you want your own welfare, you'll do like this. Uh, and if you don't, Yatra Naryas to Pujante, Ramante Tatta Devataha, Yatai Tastuna, Pujante Saravas Tatta Fala Priyaha. When women are given honor, then the demigods are pleased. And when they're not given honor, no sacred rite yields awards. Uh -huh. Again, in uh, Manasanghita, it said, Sachanti Janmayo Yatra Venayashya Sutat Kulam. Nasochanti to yatraita varadateta disarvada. Where female relations live in grief, that family very soon perishes. That society perishes. The women are very disturbed. You may say, well, this is not so important for us. We're Gaudiya Vaishnavas and, and we're chanting Hare Krishna.
But you should contemplate where and how Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu began the Sankirtan movement. In the house of Chandrasekhar Acharya, one day he called for all the devotees and said that tomorrow we're going to have a drama. And I want everybody to come. And he said that uh, I'm going to take the part of Mahalakshmi. He said only people who are free from sex desire, they can come. All the devotees were quiet. Dwita Charya, he scratched the ground with his toe and he said, I'm not going. <laughs> no one's going to go. And Mahaprabhu said, anyway, I'll give you a benediction that during this drama you won't be disturbed. And so during the drama, it was very, very nice. Haridas Taka was a choking dog. Lord Nityananda played Yoga Maya. And uh, when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came out as a Supreme Mother, Sachi Mata was sitting in the audience and she was asking, who's that? She couldn't recognize her son. And then, as you may recall, in the drama, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he, he took the role of different uh, energies of the Lord, including Radharani and Lakshmi Devi and Durga and others, and he took the devotees on his lap and he began breastfeeding. This is the beginning of the Sankirtan movement. Our Sankirtan movement means mothers. Preaching is, is a motherly activity. Uh, just as Srimati Radharani is said to be the uh, source of all mothers, if we disrespect ladies, then you're disrespecting Srimati Radharani. It's said in the Mahabharata that there was one king who abused a cow, and because of that, Surabi became very angry with him. So similarly, if you abuse women in culture, <coughs> then your society suffers. And Manasanghita is saying that. And the place where the women are happy, then that culture prospers, and especially in our Vaishnav culture. Jamayo yani grinani sapancha pratipujita tani kritya hatandaiva vinashanti samantataha. And those houses where the ladies are not given due, due honor, they're cursed. And those villages, those communities, they perish as if some black magic has been done on them. Therefore, tesma eta sada puja bhusana shadana sanai bhuti kamaya naraya nityam sa koreshu salaisu cha. Therefore, men who desire their own welfare should always give respect to women, especially said in Manasamhita, on holidays and festivals, women should be given gifts of ornaments, clothes, and sweets. It's very important. <laughs> and because everybody needs some love, everybody needs some affection, everyone needs some attention. Sometimes we tell the men that part of your service as a grahasu devotee, huh, for married men, not for brahmacharis, is to tell your wife every day, I love you and you're beautiful. That's part of your service. Because if you don't do that, some other man might do that. And you'll have problems. It's not because she's her body. You know she's not her body. She knows that. But there's some bodily identification still there. And it's needed. Therefore, we have an ashram. And we take shelter of an ashram when we have a brahmacharya ashram. And that brahmacharya ashram is a place where you practice ashraya, or shelter. If there's a hole in the ceiling, it's going to disturb your bhajan. The rain will come through. <coughs> and so you want to fix that, that hole. You want to take care of that ashram so you can have practic practical ashraya and do your bhajan. So in Grihasta ashram, a man has to take care of his wife. Otherwise, his bhajan is going to become very, very disturbed. In Vedic culture, we have to promote this, that men should respect women, and that mataji is not a bad word. Mataji <coughs> is the greatest uh, personality Invaded culture. There's an interesting story I'd like to tell you. Actually, it's a riddle. And uh, I'm going to ask see who can understand what is the answer to this. There is a, a city named Dharmashta, was on the bank of the Jamuna. And it was ruled by a king named Gunadeep. And in that village, in that city, there was a king named Kesha. He's a very religious person. He had a daughter who was very, very beautiful. And her name was Madhumavati. When she became of age, the father became worried. I have to get my daughter married. And so the brother and mother, father, all three were very worried about this. So the father, he left and went searching 
for a good uh, uh, boy to marry his daughter. The brother also, the brother the girl also went out and they went in different directions. The father, after a few days of traveling, he came to a wedding ceremony. Uh, this is very dangerous for brahmacharis to go to because people, are, the ladies are thinking about marriage there. So he saw one very handsome, nice Brahmin boy who was first class and he made some proposal, why don't you marry my daughter? Meanwhile, the brother, he'd gone to their guru's village, and while he was there, he found a nice boy. And meanwhile, at the same time, the mother was staying at home, and one very handsome Brahmin youth came to the house. And so the mother offered the daughter to that boy who came to the house, the brother offered the daughter, his sister, to uh, the boy he met in his guru's village, and the father, offered his daughter to uh, the boy that he met at this marriage ceremony. And so when the father and son returned, all of a sudden there's three boys there, all of whom are ready to marry this girl. Those boys were named Trivikram, Vaman, and Madhusudan. They were all equal in their looks and their morality, their learning and their age. And the father had a great dilemma. Who should I give my daughter to? And so he's contemplating this thing. And all of a sudden, just at that time, someone came running in Oh my God, something happened. Madhumavati, your daughter, was just bitten by a snake and she died. And so those three boys, they were lamenting, we were going to marry this girl. They're men of good character. They don't just decide I'm going to do something and then walk away from it. So they all three behave in a religious way. One of the boys, they, they, they burned the body of that girl. One of the boys took her bones and he went on pilgrimage so that he could bathe, he would sprinkle some water from different sacred rivers on those bones and ashes. A second one uh, took some more of her ashes and tied them in a bundle, and he made a house and began living there in the house with those ashes. And the third one became a mendicant, and he set out wandering about. And one day he came to the house of a Brahmin, he was begging, how, begging alms in the houses of Brahmins, so that he had some food and a place to stay. And so one Brahmin said, yes, yes, you please come in our house. And so he was sitting there in the house and he was watching the Brahmin's wife. She was cooking and she had a little child who was two or three years old and the child was annoying her, pulling on her while she was trying to cook. And the mother finally became a little angry and she picked up the child and she threw the child in the fire. And the child started screaming and the child died. So that visiting Brahmin boy said, um, I think I lost my appetite. Please excuse me, but I'll, I'll be going now. And the, the Brahmin in the house said, no, no, what's the problem? He said, what do you mean, what's the problem? Your, your wife just threw your child in a fire and he died? That's a very ghastly, terrible thing. I, I'm going to go somewhere else. Oh, that's the problem? Don't worry about that. He said, I have a special book. And he took the book <coughs> and he chanted some mantras, did some mudras over the ashes and the fire, and the child came back to life. So that visiting Brahmin was thinking, oh, that's a pretty good book. And that night, while everyone was taking rest, he stole the book and he left. And he went back to that village and just about that time, the, uh, the, the other boy who had taken her ashes and bones on pilgrimage, he returned. So they had all of her ashes and bones there. And so the boy chanted some mantras from that book over the ashes and bones and the girl came back to life. Isn't that nice? So then the question is, who should she marry? And why? What do you think? You should give a good reason. <laughs> who should she marry? Should she marry the boy who took her bones and things on pilgrimage and sprinkled water from all the sacred rivers on her? Should she marry the boy who made a house and kept the ashes there? Should she marry the boy who brought her back to life? The one who stole the book. The one who had the book. Because, Why? Because he transcribed the religious principles for the sake of. Uh, he stole something from a Brahmin yeah. for the sake of this girl and he brought her back to life. Okay. Anybody else have any thoughts? I have a question. Was this who got the book? Didn't he live the life of a mendicant? Didn't say he. It doesn't say he took sannyas, but then he just became like a mendicant. That's a good question. Yes. 
So, anybody else have any thoughts? Maybe the one who made the house with the ashes? Why? He, he had already started the relationship. Okay. Anybody else have any thoughts? So, it's a very nice riddle. The answer is that, that the first boy who had the book, he can't marry her because he acted like a father. He's a father. He brought her back to life. Father can't marry the daughter. The boy who took her ashes on pilgrimage everywhere, which is such a wonderful service, but he was serving her like a son. He also can't marry her. And the boy who made the house, he's the ideal husband, because that's the function of the man. For the wife, he has to take care and protect her. He has to make a home. So uh, that person is a qualified husband for him. In our Vaishnava culture, this thing is also there. We, we understand, we often say that, that uh, sex life is not just meant for enjoyment. It becomes confusing in this world because the soul by nature, Ananda Mnubhyasa, is looking for happiness, and especially looking for happiness in relationships. It's a very big subject, I'm a little, it's a tiny one. Um, there are three types of affection we may have. Stula Deha Priti, Sukshma Deha Priti, and Jaiva Deha Priti. We may have love for the body, which is this verse is speaking about today is a crazy idea. What do you love about her? I love how soft her skin is. Well, just let some of her skin peel off and you can keep it in a bag. And you have your sweetheart with you all the time. Or I love her hair, well then buy a wig. You know, it, it's the same thing. That's obviously very disgusting and those kind of relationships are based on exploitation. Better than that is sukshma deha priti, or affection, which is based on the subtle body. We like to play chess together. We like the same kind of music. We like this and that. But that sukshma deha priti also is not completely satisfying because it also changes. So better than that, the best of all, the only type of relationship which is not exploitive is jiva priti, or love for the soul. And that should be ahoitakiya priti atayigatma superseded to. It should be unmotivated and uninterrupted. And then it fully satisfies the self. There's a nice article from Shilo Bhantasidanta Sarasvati Thakur, which is published in the uh, Sajjana Natoshan, where he speaks about Vaishnava marriage. And he says that generally, the guru doesn't allow the disciples to marry, doesn't encourage them to marry, because he sees they're not qualified. He says some very interesting things. He says the cardinal principle of an ashram association is that no one is the owner of any property or the service of another. Everyone is only a servant of those whose activities are ever in the service of God. And so he says that in Vaishnava marriage, it's not that the husband is serving the wife or the wife is serving the husband. Vaishnava marriage is not the same as Vedic marriage. Because a Vaishnava, how will the Vaishnava accept service from another Vaishnava? But rather they serve each other for the sake of pleasing Guru and Krishna. Bhaktisiddhanta says, neither the husband nor the wife should claim the services of his or her partner on their own account. Both of them are only to offer their services if and when their partner is pleased to permit them to share their service of Krishna. None of them can force their partners to serve them. <clears throat> this is Vaishnava marriage. He says, the reason why the Guru does not ordinarily ask any person to enter the state of wedlock is that it's very rare to find anyone in this world who is willing to regard his or her wife as husband, his, his wife or husband as worthy of his or her unconditional services. This is, however, exactly the relationship between husband and wife that alone can be sanctioned by the Guru. That's Vaishnava marriage. It's for the sake and for the pleasure of Guru and Krishna. We were giving a lecture a few years ago in Odessa and Arisa and Ukraine, and I was mentioning how uh, devotees should love one another. And there was one brahmacharya who was there and he became a little disturbed. He said, Prabhuji, said, there's no such thing as love in the material world. And it's a fact. Prabhupada said that, and we often preach that there is no such thing as love in the 
material world. But this is not the material world, this building. The Vaishnavas are not living in the material world. And therefore, Srila Prabhupada, in one lecture in Los Angeles in 1968, he said that uh, we should learn to love the devotees. This is society. It's important, he says, to love Krishna and to love the devotees. But how do we do that? We were quoting a verse from Sattva the Tantra a few days ago. Hari Lila Satochara Parishi Satatam Tvaya Karya Pritastava Hariya Tabhakti Nanashati. We should love devotees by hearing and chanting together. Everyone wants love. I don't like the idea personally of preaching to new people when they come to the temple and telling them there's no such thing as love. Well, what is it? Are you supposed to just become a renunciate? And a sannyasi? And that's what's happened in our society sometimes. But people can't live like that because they want some relationship. They need some love. Rather than telling them there's no such thing as love, we tell them we should have love, but you don't know what love is. Love means Krishna. And if we have Krishna in the center, if Krishna is our motivation and our relationships, brahmacharis can and should have loving relationships with other brahmacharis and the ladies with other ladies and sannyasis with sannyasis. And the husband should love the wife. The wife should love the husband. But they should love that. Love should be there, not on the bodily platform, which is not really love. That's still deha priti, just some affection for some stool and urine. That love should be there by keeping Krishna in the center. <laughs> Krishna is so wonderful. It's very natural. We'll love devotees. If we hear and chant with them, if we experience some ecstasy, some happiness of doing kirtan, having Krishna kata with the devotees, and doing service with the devotees, we're definitely going to love them. And I told my brahmachari friend this. And he said, but, but, when the husband or wife dies and you'll cry. I said, yes, you'll cry. But that crying is not ordinary crying. You're crying for a Vaishnava. We should cry. That kind of crying is good for us. It's good for our heart. In the, uh, so they said, Hari Lila Satokchara Parishi Satatam Tvekari Pritastavari Yata Bhakti Manashati. Your bhakti will be protected if you learn to love devotees. And we love them by coming together and hearing and chanting. In the uh, Brihad Bhagavatamrita, Hanuman, who's a great uh, brahmachari, he tells Narad Muni uh, about some grihastas, about Yudhisthira Maharaj. Na priya deha sambandhan na chapter varga sadhanat param shri krishna padabja prema sambandhata priya. He says that the Yudhishthira's family members, uh, they're very dear to him. He loves his wife, he loves his brothers, he loves his children. He says, but not, uh, they're not dear to him, not chapter varga sadhanat, not because of Anashin Dharma. They're not dear to him because they're going to help him to get Dharma, Arta, Kama, and maybe Moksha. They're dear to him, Param Shri Krishna, Param Jap, Prema Sambandha, not Priya. They're very dear to him because they love Krishna. And that kind of relationship is a different relationship. And Sanatana Goswami comments that it's true that Yudhisthira was very attached to his brothers and his wife, but that attachment was not material. It was based not on identification with the material bodies, but it was based on pure spiritual identities of he and his family as being eternal servants of Krishna. That he had loved them, but that love was based on Krishna. Draupadi was the most excellent queen any emperor could have, and she was empowered with the beauty and other transcendental qualities of Lakshmi Devi. But Yudhisthira's affection for her was not due to being attracted by these qualities. He was completely immune to such attraction. Yudhisthira's brothers and wife also offered him valuable assistance in fulfilling his responsibilities for Dharma, Arta, Kama, and Moksha. These four material aims of life, however,